This is Partners in Crime with Adam Croft and Robert Dawes. Hello. Welcome to another fun-filled, fun-packed episode of Partners in Crime. Well, so that's put the gauntlet well and truly down on the floor. Mm. Uh, right, what can I say about fun and filled? Um, uh, I've just had a very nice breakfast, so I feel filled. And, and uh, because I've just uh, turned up at my dear friend Adam's place, I'm, of course, feeling full of fun. Uh, is that a sort of a fit for purpose? I guess it is. Yeah. Here we are again. Yeah. Hello, everyone, wherever you may be uh, during this wonderful summer month. Uh, though if you're in the UK at this moment in time, it probably feels like it's the middle of October. Um, lots of cloud, lots of drizzle. Um, and uh, oh, getting the weather in early, see? straight. I left it too mm. late last week. You've got to get straight. Mm. So it's been very... Very strange times. It doesn't feel like summer at all. Everyone keeps on promising a heat wave, which, uh, of course, is sweeping many parts of the rest of the world uh, with unfortunate consequences. So I don't know whether I look forward to a heat wave uh, anymore. But there we are. We're here broadcasting again with lots of interesting things, I hope, we hope, uh, for you to listen to this week. Have you got a one that you'd like to kick us off with, or shall I? Well, I was going to kick off with the weather much like you did. I had a look this morning because I thought, yeah. it looks quite bright this morning. Is this the beginning of this heat wave we've been promised? Um, no. And it looked like today was OK. And <laughs> it's got rain for the rest of the week. So I'm not, not quite sure when that's coming in, whether it's just wishful thinking. Keep, or... your, keep your SF Factor 50 safe in a cupboard. You don't need you, it. Not this week. Do you think I wear Factor 50 with this skin? No, no, you no. do. No, you do. You have got all. You've got a year-round tan, mm. and you don't use booze. To, uh, you don't use lotions and potions to develop the perfect no. tan without stain marks. No, I go on holiday in the summer, and then I don't wash for a year. Ah, I, ah that's what it. Well, that accounts for the um, yeah. aroma. Right. Um. Good. Uh, well, I've got uh, something quite interesting to say, and it's got nothing to do with crime uh, thrillers in any way whatsoever. I mean, given that we've slightly widened our berth just ever so slightly, mm -hmm. loosened uh, uh, um, our waistline um, to allow other topics uh, in. Um, I watched the most fascinating film the night before last, um, and it is called My Octopus Teacher. And okay. there is, to legitimise it to some degree into the um, uh, format that we uh, we follow most weeks, it is a, a, a one of those sort of natural mysteries. It's an extraordinary film. In fact, it won the best Oscar for documentary this year. And if you haven't seen it, I'd say go and see it. Um, because it's really rather splendid. I'll tell you a little bit uh, about it. My Octopus Teacher is a 2020 Netflix original documentary filmed and directed by Pippa Erdrich and James Reed, which documents a year spent by filmmaker Craig Foster forging a relationship with a wild, common octopus in a South African kelp forest. At the 93rd Academy Awards, it won the award for Best Documentary Feature. And it is quite an extraordinary uh, film, uh, very moving uh, at times. And uh, who knew that I think octopuses come under the natural heading of mollusks, uh, but who knew that uh, these extraordinary uh, creatures uh, had such um, intelligence um, and uh, abilities. And if you know nothing we, about octopuses... We should put that on the, our trailer for Partners in Crime. Was that? Who knew these creatures had such extraordinary intelligence and abilities? <laughs> <laughs> ah, yes, you'll get a few answers to that particular. <laughs> uh, um, so, yeah, it's absolutely fantastic. Uh, it's, uh, as you say, about um, uh, Craig, who started his... Um, he'd had, I think, very clearly, it's sort of mentioned very briefly, he'd had some sort of uh, breakdown. Um, about uh, 11 years ago and found himself very vulnerable uh, mentally and um, uh, he started to document his experiences um, whilst swimming just off the coast where he lives uh, um, in Simonstown on the Cape Peninsula which is exposed to the cold Benguela current of the Atlantic Ocean and those seas are can be incredibly rough but he finds a, um, a piece in the kelp forest which is uh, more shallow water and uh, it's protected from the big surges on the whole of the Atlantic uh, for, by the, the kelp, which absorbs um, apparently extraordinary amounts of, of pressure coming from the ocean. 
And he started to document his experiences uh, and met a curious young octopus. And I'm not going to say anything more because it is quite an extraordinary journey he goes on, um, a healing journey, a learning journey. Um, and to watch it, you feel sort of rather privileged, really. And, uh, and it does reveal uh, the mysteries uh, of this extraordinary creature, uh, the octopus, and what uh, uh, this uh, beautiful, and it is quite beautiful, um, uh, uh, animal can, uh, can, can how they can help uh, and how this uh, they only live for a year so the documentary um, it tells a story over the year from the first meeting the octopus uh, to its uh, uh, to its death which is incredibly moving um, and at the end of it you have, uh, get a sense that uh, this man has come from his own dark places and has been healed by nature to the to the point that he's uh, with his son and uh, exploring the the oceans with his teenage son and uh, their relationship uh, is in a remarkably fine uh, place because of all this so anyway that's a, a recommendation which as i say has got nothing to do with crime uh, apologies no apologies for that actually um, i just i'll talk about whatever fancy i i, I, I tickled me fancy in any given week so that is it if you watch it on netflix it's a super Superb um, documentary, Oscar-winning documentary, My Octopus Teacher. I think it's a reasonable recommendation. Who doesn't like octopuses, after all? Um, Val McDermid um, has um, been throwing the uh, the death threats around this week. Uh, there's, a, there's a headline in the eye that said, um, Val McDermid, a lot of people have to die before I can write my memoir. Um, not quite as threatening as it sounds. Actually, she was um, talk talking about the fact that publishers have often asked her to write her memoirs, but she said, I'd never be out of the libel courts. A lot of people have to die before I can write my memoir. And in fact, instead, when she uh, started writing her, her latest book um, last spring, 2020, she realised that she couldn't set something in the modern world because of the COVID thing. It'd be coming out in 2021. She didn't know what the world would look like, what position would be in. So she thought, actually, I'll just hold off on that. And uh, she wrote a book set in 1979. We've we've mentioned it, I think, before. Yes, we have. Yeah. In fact, it's called 1979. Um, it's out uh, this week, Thursday. So go get it. Um, her first new series in 20 years. She says she's been toying with writing a sequence of novels at 10-year intervals with the same protagonist. Um, and to avoid the COVID situation, she needed to end in 2019, which was the last normal year. So this uh, series of, of four books that will be wow. occurring, one every 10 years, um, will will land in exactly that way. It will end in, in 2019. We'll see how technology and society and uh, crime investigation changes over that time. It's, so uh, Val will probably be about 110 by the time she finishes writing it. Is that what you're saying? She's not writing one every 10 years. Oh, I see. It's, no. it's, it's, oh, I see. Right. Okay. 79, yeah. 89, yeah. Oh, 99. right, right, yeah, right, right. right. So, right. So okay. Or, or yeah. however yeah. far it is. But uh, yeah, essentially she's going to end up... Uh, so yeah, it'll be five books, wouldn't there? Yeah. yeah, we're great at maths. Welcome to the Maths Podcast. <laughs> uh, yeah, oh, that's... That, <laughs> That's yeah, so that's that, that's out. But uh, yeah, she, she made some interesting. Um, we'll, we'll put a link in the show notes for this this article from the Eye. But um, she used to be a reporter on the Sunday People in Manchester. She was one of three women out of 137 journalists. Um, one male editor, she says, told her to uh, get a photo of an interviewee in her underwear, even though the story had absolutely nothing to do with underwear whatsoever. Uh -huh. This is why she's not writing her memoirs, because these people would be identified, I guess. Uh, in the 80s, she went to talk to an editor about a vacancy. She wanted to recommend one of the regular Saturday freelancers there, uh, who was a female journalist, and apparently the editor looked at her blankly and said, we've already got a woman. <laughs> oh, God. Which is uh, an interesting way of looking at uh, things, isn't it? Oh. Um, but also, something we've else, which is... We've already got a woman. Yeah. So something else I found very interesting is we nearly didn't have Val McDermott as a crime writer because it was only a chance discovery at the age of nine when she discovered uh, a volume of Agatha Christie in her grandparents' house, even though they weren't readers at all. And she suspects someone must have just left it there accidentally. And that sparked her love for crime novels. I also taught her two lasting lessons 
that crime fans, it says here in the eye, will devour an author's back catalogue, and thank God for that. <laughs> um, she had to scour the car boot sales for more Agatha Christie novels because she couldn't take any more out of the library, and also that she needed a strategy to sell lots of books. And I think there are two things that we can quite um, confidently say she's been very successful with. Um, yes, magnificently so. Oh, well, that's well, fascinating. Well, I'm going now to my um, recommendation for audiobook this week. Mm. For all of you who are travelling around the country, I've just been uh, uh, travelling around a bit. I've been in the Cotswolds working um, and uh, various other places. The roads are packed. You're all out there in your, your cars, your camper vans, your, your picnic baskets packed. Um, you're all staying in the UK uh, and uh, it's chocker. Absolutely chocker. Um, so uh, I know that because it took me about uh, an hour and a quarter to actually do a what was normally a fifteen-minute journey. Um, so anyway, there we are. That's the price of holidays. But uh, whether you're in a traffic jam or uh, sitting on a high peak or on the the, the Malvern Hills or, or in the Peak District or wherever you happen to be, um, I hope that uh, you're having a splendid holiday. I was going to say at least you're not you know having to go down twice a week to one of the uh, prime tourist areas in. The UK and having to go to the Cotswolds for for work or anything like that that was that would be horrendous, wouldn't it? it would, you know, listen, someone's got to do it. I <laughs> didn't say it was easy. I didn't say it was easy. But so yeah. Well, anyway, I hope everyone's having a nice um, uh, a nice holiday. Goodness knows we uh, all deserve it. Um, so while you're in this traffic jam, I hope you're not, or just actually idling through the country lanes and taking in the beautiful scene, British British scenery, um, or maybe just charging down the M1, waiting to get stuck uh, on. On the M25, why not listen to a classic crime thriller? And this week I am recommending the audio book, which you can download from Kobo, uh, called The Big Sleep by the extraordinarily magnificent Raymond Chandler. Um, it is narrated by a host of wonderful talents, including Barbara Barnes, uh, Jude Akawadiki, lovely Jude, who I've had the great pleasure of working with, uh, Madeline Potter, Sam Dale, I've also worked with Sam, he's a lovely chap, Sean Baker, and um, the main character, Philip Marlowe, if any one of you, and I'm sure many of you are, uh, know of uh, Chandler's uh, main hero, Philip Marlowe, is played by Toby Stevens. So this is the synopsis for you. Fast-talking, trouble-seeking, private eye Philip Marlowe is a different kind of detective, a moral man in an amoral world. California in the 40s and 50s is as beautiful as a ripe fruit and rotten to the core, and Marlowe must struggle to retain his integrity amidst the corruption he encounters daily. The Big Sleep finds the world weary, wise-cracking investigator consulted by a wealthy family man with two big problems. His children. Carmen Sternwood has got herself mixed up with the blackmailer, while Vivian has managed to mislay her husband, ex bootlegger Rusty Regan. Old ailing General Sternwood hires Marlowe to take care of things. But it's not too long before the bodies start piling up and Marlowe finds himself knee deep in trouble. Starring Toby Stevens, this landmark dramatisation retains all the suspense and excitement of Chandler's complex and compelling novel. It sounds absolutely terrific and um, at an hour and 40 minutes in length, it should get you through uh, the uh, from junction uh, 20 to junction 19 on the M25 with ease. So there we are. That's my Kobo audio, Bobo's audio book of the week oh, um The Big Sleep by the magnificent Raymond Chandler. Well, if you are um, perhaps not going on holiday, but are staying at home and looking for something to do, you might be pleased to find out that BritBox have uh, added some uh, British mystery classics to their platform this month. Some more, that Ooh. is. Um, Agatha Christie's Death on the Nile uh, and Murder on the Orient Express landed earlier this month, uh, as did season 10 of Vera, with uh, Brenda Bletton, of course, yes. uh, based on the Anne Cleves novels. And in, well, actually, on today, if you're talking about Friday when the podcast comes out rather than Wednesday when we're recording, um, Evil Under the Sun, another Agatha Christie, lands yes. on there with uh, Maggie Smith, Diana Rigg, and Peter Ustinov. So um, com- I saw that recently. Complete cast of nobodies there. Um, <laughs> the, the, the Mirror Cracked is also on um, landing on there on Friday. Is that with Beth Davis in that one? 
No, she was mm. in um, Death on the Nile with Mia Farrow. Oh, Maggie who's Smith. in the cast of... Mira Cracked is Angela Lansbury and Elizabeth Taylor. That's right. Yeah, so that's landing uh, as well. And on the 26th, so what's that next week, season one of Professor T lands on BritBox, which is based on the hit Belgian TV series. It's set against a stunning backdrop of one of the world's most prestigious... I'll try that again. Prestigious <laughs> educational <laughs> institutions. <laughs> Cam- <laughs> Cambridge University. If I don't know if you've ever heard of it, perhaps. Uh, ben Miller plays the eccentric but brilliant criminologist Professor Jasper Tempest, alongside Tony Award-winning actress Frances Delatour as his colourful but overbearing mother Adelaide. So that lands on a Brit box. Um, next week, I should also mention while I'm here. Um, these messages that we're contractually obliged to do, like the fact that Bob mentioned Kobo a few minutes ago. So how's that for a, a, a very um, poor segue into the <laughs> fact that we're sponsored by Kobo? Very gratefully so. And as a listener to Partners in Crime, you can get 90% off of your first ebook purchase with them. Just go to Kobo.com, enter the promo code CRIME at the checkout. And if you've claimed that already, then you can follow the link in the show notes and the promo code PARTNERS will get you 40% off of selected ebook purchases for life. Mr. Well, Dawes. Well, that's fascinating. Well, that uh, Professor T, of course, is um, a British adaptation of a, a Scandinavian uh, television series. Is it Belgian? It said in the thing, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I didn't say my geography was any good. I, I, um, I just thought maybe they lose Belgium. I don't know. I don't know. Attention. I, yeah, it may, may, maybe it's Belgium. Maybe it's Belgium. I've been watching, and I recommended last week, a, a wonderful co Belgium uh, Frank uh, French uh, television series called Dark Spot, mm. Black Spot, uh, which is um, very good. And so that's a sort of a segue into uh, this if I can get my phone to work. There we are. That's a big Um, if. That's a big if. The marvellous Paul Herons, uh, as usual, has got his finger well and truly on the pulse uh, on his uh, The Killing Times. And uh, he puts this out this week with a spoiler warning. So I'll try not to try to um, avoid spoiling anything. But those uh, who are interested that we know that you know that we are huge fans of Chris Lang's uh, Unforgotten, which has had four series on ITV and uh, hopefully another one coming up. Uh, in the new year. So uh, the leading uh, actor in that was Nicola Walker with Sanji Bhaskar, of course. Um, So when Nicola Walker announced her first post-Unforgotten project, it took people by surprise. With all... This is Paul here in uh, writing. With with all due uh, respect to UK TV channel Alibi, it doesn't rival the bigger channels in terms of audience. However, perhaps Walker taking on Annika, which is the name of this series, wasn't so much of a surprise. She's been starring in the radio version for a number of years. The surprise is that TV channels hadn't adapted it for the small screen until now. Walker indeed reprises reprises her role as Dr Annika Strathhead, a likeable, breezy but cuttingly sarcastic detective in Scotland's Marine Homicide Unit. Yes, a Marine Homicide Unit Mm. does exist. She's moved to Scotland from Norway, There's the merest hint of Scandi in her accent, but Strandhead takes everything in her stride, from single parenthood, a teenage daughter who's having trouble fitting into her new surroundings, and a team that is lukewarm towards her, to say the least. Oh, and a murder. A man called Arthur Hendry, owner of a whale sightseeing business, that was quite a good thing to do, Uh, (laughs) ah yes, I'm the owner of a whale sightseeing business, is found harpooned to death. (laughs) <laughs> and, uh, sorry, I wasn't expecting that. And a number of suspects uh, quickly emerge. And when I say quickly, really do mean quickly. Annika does not much. Does not much. Uh, Annika does not much around it. Try again. Get get a, get a run up. No, I think there's a slight uh, spelling mistake here. It's not uh. just my uh, inability to speak, uh, <laughs> which of course is well known by all. Uh, anyway, that's going into the the spoil bit. So I'm not going to do that. What's different and what makes Annika an engaging watch are two things. Nicola Walker, of course, is not surprisingly an actor playing a character for a number of years is on supreme form and it feels like Annika as a character fits her like a glove she's naturally warm and funny too the other dimension this has is the fourth wall or the smashing of it Annika regularly talks to us and the audience and gives insights and even tells jokes I say I say I say my dog's got no nose it's an interesting device that sometimes works and in this case 
it does. As for the case, well, it's engaging enough, but it's a bit flimsy. There are plenty of templates and ideas that we've seen before, but it zips along in a pleasing join-the-dots fashion. It's great to have Walker back on our screens, here, here, and although Annika feels a bit light, Mayor of Easton, East Town it is not, it's definitely worth a watch. So there we are. That's uh, Annika, and uh, it's on uh, Alibi. Um, and uh, if Paul uh, Herons is recommending it, uh, I think it's well worth a watch. And I am uh, going to watch that over the next couple of days. Uh, so I'm recommending it prior to witnessing it myself. But it sounds great, and anything with Nicola Walker is bound to be super. There we are, Annika, Alibi. Well, if you were a, or are, a Panthers in Crime patron, you could have got to watch Bob reading that off of his phone. Because don't Panthers, put, in, don't put them off. Don't put Panthers them off. in Crime patrons uh, get early access to every episode of Panthers in Crime. They get to watch it in full HD, which I'm hoping to shift up to 4K soon. Don't oh, you know? Da, don't da, you know? Da, 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 <laughs> you also get an extra bonus episode each week, Partners in Crime Arsenic and Old Lace, which we record straight after the main show, which tends to be um, even more irreverent. <laughs> <laughs> is, that, is, that, is that the word I want? Well, um, yes. I mean, yes, it's uh, it's definitely something. I don't know <laughs> we call it irreverent. And you, all sorts of other stuff as well. We'd love for you to be involved. The link to the, the, uh, the Patreon programme is in the show notes. Uh, something else which I found uh, this week, we talked about Slaughterfest a little while yes, back. Yes, we did. Yeah. Um, Karen Slaughter and Harper Fiction have teamed up to put on a crime writing festival which will take place via the Killer Reads Facebook page on the 4th of September. It will feature more than 30 authors across eight panels, and the, the lineup has been, been revealed. It includes uh, the author of Girl A, Abigail Dean, as well as Abby Mukherjee, Dorothy Coomson. Uh, Karen Slaughter will open the festival by interviewing Abigail Dean, and it will be followed by a panel on historical thrillers with Abby Mukherjee and Laura Shepard Robinson, plus a discussion of true crime with Carol Ann Lee, Joseph Knox and Katie Lowe. Um, some other interesting um, names, short fiction, will be discussed with Vaseem Khan, friend of the show, Rachel Hall and the wonderfully named David Hesker Wambly Wyden, who um, <laughs> I looked up because that's, it's, it's, that's four names, David Hesker Wambly Wyden. I thought, Wembley. Oh. Yeah, Wembley. he um, apparently he's an enrolled citizen. The of road the, to Wembley. <laughs> he's an enrolled citizen of the Sichangu Lakota Nation, which is uh, on the land now known as the uh, Rosebud Reservation in South Dakota. South Dakota, hence the wonderful name. Uh, Alice Hunter, Caroline Kepnes, Fiona Cummins, and Jeffrey Diva will be debating serial oh. killers in fiction and why they're here to stay. And Jane Casey, Imran Mahmood, Nadine Matheson and Simon Mir will talk about crime in the courtroom, followed by Dorothy Coombson, Louise Candlish and Lucy Foley discussing thematic shifts in writing. And then Robert Peston, Adam Hamdy and Charlotte Philby, the granddaughter of, uh, of Kim Philby, will be debating political thrillers. And wow. she should know a fair bit about those. Yeah. So there we go. That's um, 4th of September. Well, that's, awesome. that's great. Well, just to, uh, I'm going to recommend, I've uh, been reading a Bookseller. Uh, I get it every week. And uh, and they are previewing books now for November. Mm -hmm. um, so far ahead. So if you're looking for a book uh, uh, run for someone to give someone at Christmas or in actually as a lovely present to yourself, uh, this is very strongly uh, recommended uh, by uh, uh, Alison Flood, who, uh, as you know, is the editor of this particular section of uh, the bookseller. And it is a new novel by Maxine Mel Fung Chung, and it's called The Eighth Girl. Alexa Wu, whose life is controlled by her multiple personalities and her disassociative identity disorder, is drawn into London's underworld when her best friend, Ella, one of the few people to know who Alexa really is, gets a job at a high-end gentleman's club. The author is a practising... This is uh, uh, Maxine. The author is a practising psychoanalytic uh, psychotherapist who completed the Faber Academy Advanced Novel Writing course and her expertise shines through. This is a many-layered, intelligent and chilling novel with an excellent final twist. It's also just been optioned by Netflix. So, um, yes, it's called The Eighth Girl by Maxine Mel Fung Shung. Uh, comes very highly recommended... Uh, 
to for, from the new November previews in the bookseller uh, this week. So keep an eye on that one, or see if you can get it now. Yes, sounds brilliant. I've got another book to uh, mention for you in just a moment. First of all, apologies for not being here last week. Um, yeah, welcome by the way to our brand new fortnightly podcast, Partners in Crime, as it's uh, yeah, what happened last to be. week. I did. Um, no, uh, wasn't our fault this week. Um, Moriarty, his oh. um, his baby came early. It was oh. wife's baby. Oh, their congratulations, baby, so. Moriarty! Congratulations, Moriarty! Yes, and so, um, and 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 your partner. That's wonderful news. Boy or a girl? A little girl. Oh, a little girl. Yes. I love so, it. Um, yes, congratulations to them. And my fault this time. Next week we won't be here either because um, because I'm not around. Oh, uh, we are. So. We are. So they they seek us there. They seek us. Yeah. They seek us here. They seek us there. They seek those elusive. What do we call ourselves? Podcasters everywhere. <laughs> What, what do I call you? Or? Uh, no, well, no, we can't broadcast that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, October as well will be missing a week towards the end because mm. um, yeah, my daughter will be um, arriving. So it's all go. It's all go. I mean, that's exciting. Yeah, I mean, everyone yeah, I know, yeah. I'm, my nephews and nieces are, uh, are dropping babies left, right, and centre. Very, very happily, I have to say. Uh, we've got little baby Oscar, which I saw at the weekend. Absolutely a- a- adorable. We've got a little baby Eddie. Um, uh, as well, I'm just it's, it's great. Mm. It's it's great, and uh, of course, um, at the moment, I don't have to change any nappies because no. uh, my children uh, are well past that. Yeah, just as their father may be actually moving into that particular zone. But um, <laughs> well, yeah, it's yeah, lots of lots of babies knocking around. Not much else to do in lockdown, I suppose, is there? Daddy's got a zimmer, and he wears. Where's nappies? There we are. That's it. <laughs> There's a quote for you. That's it. But um, the reason I was saying that is because this will be the last August episode, we believe. So it's your last chance to get hold of the free book of the month from Kobo for August, if you are a Partners in Crime patron. Uh, it's Power and Control by Robert H. Wilde, the first book in the More Than Detectives series. Um, you can get that in your Patreon dashboard now. That's one of the benefits you get, by the way, from being a patron. You uh, get a free book every single month from, from Kobo, which makes it worthwhile. And I, I would say probably takes the edge off of having to see our faces every week. That was uh, only a silence could greet that particular thing because I'm sure there must be thousands upon thousands of our listeners across the globe who are just desperate to actually see um, your well coiffed hair and uh, <laughs> and uh, and my um, what have I got um, six pack <laughs> <laughs> yes. My well, my well crafted six pack um, <laughs> in action. So yeah, well there we go. Um, and, and another week, another week on on the podcast. It's really it, marvelous. I'm looking forward to getting back on the boards. Actually, I've actually got a job, which is quite nice. And uh, uh, moving onwards uh, into theatre, and it's lovely to see theatres opening up, uh, leading the way, as we mentioned on the podcast before, was uh, the Mousetrap, which opened with the ingenious idea, although I'm sure it's not inexpensive from a producer's point of view, of having two casts. So if anyone was unfortunate enough to uh, get uh, the virus, uh, then uh, a member of the other cast could actually um, pop in and play the part and and they've got understudies as well so I think they've covered themselves uh, as much as any uh, commercial theatre enterprise can possibly do considering they don't get insurance at all which mm. is uh, quite extraordinary and um, the fact that they're operating at all in this uh, day and age is, is, is quite remarkable and a tribute to the tenacity of uh, producers and people in theatre uh, everywhere. So yes, as I say, the mousetrap uh, from our point of view, from a crime thriller uh, podcast point of view leading the way in, 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 in theatre and others are following and people are going to to the theatre once more and apparently incredibly enthusiastically um, and uh, I think it's dawning on, on people how much they have missed live entertainment be it mm. a, a theatrical or variety as they used to call it or or whatever it is just having a good time so is it, is it getting better though from a, from a work point of view in terms of in terms of the theatre I, I think it is to... it's going to be very slow it's going to be very slow I mean the money seeping through from uh, government grants to help uh, so it's very slow in uh, in finding itself 
itself to getting to where it's needed the most, yeah. to put it mildly. And also, there's been a complete neglect of uh, the commercial uh, world. So, but there, there is there is work um, beginning to, to to take place, um, and hopefully, if if things continue, um, you know, pray that this pandemic uh, pandemic doesn't uh, sort of turn into something else, and and we move out of it and with mm. with, with health and and energy. Uh, it's it's on its way back, and I should imagine, hopefully, if all goes well this time next year, uh, th- theatre may be operating as it uh, as it once did. It, it is slow, but it's happening, which yeah. is fantastic. And you got theatre work coming up? Yes, yeah, I'm start rehearsals on Monday, which is I'm looking forward to very much indeed. Doing a check off the cherry orchard, mm. uh, and um, it's, I've always, you know, I said to Amy about a month ago. No, well, about, about longer than that, I said, about six weeks ago. And she said, what do you fancy doing? I said, do you know what? I'd love to do a Chekhov play. And I put it out there, and uh, I'm not particularly new agey in my thinking, but I put it out to the universe, and to my great surprise, the universe answered um, uh, in the in the form of uh, of Bill Kenwright and said, "Come and come and do the the cherry orchard." So mm. it's a yes, it's a, it's a lovely, lovely, lovely cast and uh, a lovely theatre, uh, the Theatre Royal Windsor, um, and so yeah, that will take me through uh, with, with work. Ah, that wonderful oh, four-letter word. Yes. Work through to um, uh, November, so I'm, I'm, I'm delighted with that. Wonderful. And who's the cast? Um, well, we've got Francesca Annis, uh, mm. the wonderful Francesca Annis, um, Jenny Seagrove, uh, Martin Shaw, mm. and uh, the, the, uh, the wonderful and great, which is not to say the others aren't also, but the extraordinary Ian McKellen. Um <laughs> <laughs> How did you get that up? Got, got there in the end. Well, of course, he's been playing Hamlet at the age of 82 for the last... So, I mean, I, I, goodness, I'm, I'm getting the most extraordinarily brilliant reviews, as you'd expect. How to make you say it yeah. at some point. Yeah. I, I, I thought you would have mentioned it within the first five minutes. I was trying that, that not to... overrunning. I was having trying to not to mention it, but I should have, <laughs> should have known. Yes, yeah, so um, the... Uh, I mean, I can remember... 40 years ago now, sitting on the front row of the Warehouse Theatre in Covent Garden, watching uh, he and uh, Judy Dench do uh, perform uh, Macbeth for the RSC and, and thinking that was the finest thing I've ever seen. So I'm ever so slightly intimidated to be turning up with my script on Monday morning and and uh, the, uh, and he'll be there. But uh, it's, a, it's one of the cast with a, a, a great company. Sean Mathias is directing. Um, they're performing Hamlet now, which is supposed to be just an extraordinary... Uh, experience to go and see the um, Ian McKellen at the age of 82 with an extraordinary cast including uh, Francis Barber, Jenny Segro and lots of the company who are doing the Cherry Orchard are going to be rehearsing that during the day and playing Hamlet at night so that's mm. you know that, that hardly ever happens anymore uh, so uh, uh, Bill Canwright and Sean Mathias are doffing their caps with this company uh, to the way that theatre used to be, which was sort of a you know a, around the clock. So that's going to be fascinating. Jonathan Hyde is, is in it playing Claudius and lots of other extraordinarily uh, uh, fine uh, a- actors. Um, so look it up. It's the mm. Theatre Royal uh, and uh, Hamlet's plays through till um, uh, September the twenty fifth. So get wow. your ticket if you can because they're uh, I think they're very hard to come by. And the Cherry Orchard opens on. October the 1st and run through to November the 13th. There we are. That was the plug I wasn't going to do, but it's been done. So Well, we put that clip together, so I had to, I had to push you for it. And you have to, this is what, what we have to do. If, 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 if he's gone to the trouble, if Adam's gone to the trouble of making a clip, he has to feed it in somehow. I can understand that. Okay. So um, there we seven, are. Seven minutes of my life wasted otherwise. Yeah. <laughs> right, so um, yeah, I think we are there, aren't we? I think we've, yeah. um, we've got Partners in Crime, Arsenic and Old Lace, the yeah. after show uh, show to put together, but not uh, before a coffee refill, I think. And uh, yes, uh, coffee pit stop. Anyway, have a lovely week. Uh, find the weather if you possibly can. Lovely fortnight. Uh, a lovely fortnight. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Do you know I, yeah. I'll, I'll miss it. I mean, uh, I, I miss doing this podcast. Now, what number are we on, by the way? One hundred and forty-eight. One hundred and forty-eight. We're coming. Good grace, we're nearly going. That's extraordinary. One hundred and forty-eight podcasts, and uh, you think we'd be got? We'd have got better by now, but uh, if we can organise it in time, we should do one hundred and fifty live. Yeah. 
I mean, pretty much live anyway. We record as live, so yeah. all we'd really have to do is just change our recording time to a time when people can actually sit and watch. Do you know what would be also fun is to actually talk to one of our listeners? That sounds complicated. Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> we can we can we can try. Yeah, well, it might be nice, even if it's yeah. pre-record, because yeah, yeah. you know it's, it would be lovely to have something coming back from uh, wherever you happen to listen to your podcast. And the, the the beauty and versatility of this particular medium is that you can listen to it pretty much anywhere in the bath, on the tube, on a. Well, you probably can't listen to it on a flight, can you? I don't yeah. know. No, you can. Yeah, you could if you downloaded it before. Oh yeah, yeah, download it before you see. Uh, in jail. My technical finger, well and truly, on the pulse, as usual. Um, so there we are. Wi-Fi on the planes now as well. Oh, can you? Mm-hmm. Oh, good goodness. It's, 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 a, it's a one I discover America every day. Uh, okay. So there we are. So maybe we could actually uh, listen to uh, uh, some, of, some of our listeners, wherever they happen to be, in Canada or Australia, the United States of America. Jail on a plane. Swindon, mm. Scunthorpe. Um, wherever it would be lovely to listen to you so see if we can get that going in that week off alright so from us thank you very much for listening I hope you've enjoyed our recommendations this week um, as um, eclectic as they turned out to be um, documentaries uh, audio books and uh, new novels on the way so and of course the latest uh, well, with Val McDermott which is always fascinating Val McDermott toodle pip bye Partners in Crime was presented by Adam Croft and Robert Dawes and produced by Adam Croft. The theme tune was by the Caesarians. The Partners in Crime logo and imagery were designed by Stuart Bache. Partners in Crime is sponsored by Kobo, your favourite local bookshop, perfected. Perfected.